Good afternoon from Singapore. Uh, welcome to a DBS group research uh, webinar, and this is on the much talked about China NPC, as well as our view on Hong Kong. Um, so we decided to combine both issues for this webinar. Uh, for we great deal of pleasure to have with me senior economist uh, Nathan Chow with me, who will go over the China story. We also have economist slash strategist uh, Samuel Say with us, and Samuel will be talking about Hong Kong. Uh, of course, there are overlaps on the issue, particularly with respect to zero COVID and its impact across borders. Um, so there will be some overlap in the two discussions as well. Uh, I suppose the way we will organize this webinar is to have Nathan go first, talk about Nathan about 20, 25 minutes. That sounds about good. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, we will have uh, Sam come in and he will go over Hong Kong. I think we will have, after Sam's presentation, five to 10 minutes left for question and answers. Uh, this is a WebEx webinar. It has a chat function. You can see on the bottom right corner of your screen that there is a, a link that takes you to chat. I have already posted a welcome message there. Uh, please feel free to write down your questions or comments there. I'll be monitoring throughout the webinar. This is not necessarily going to be so structured that we will have two back-to-back -back presentations with no back and forth. Uh, if there are questions in between during these uh, presentations, I will flag them to the speakers and perhaps we can even entertain them uh, while they're presenting. Uh, so let's just make, make the flow a little better, so feel free to write down any comments and queries you may have. Uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, Nathan, uh, all yours. Uh, go ahead with your China part of the presentation. All right. Thank you, Tamar, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so uh, on the first slide, I have put up a table here showing some key takeaways from the Party Congress, the 20th Party Congress. So a lot of topics have been covered by, by uh, President, President Xi Jinping from foreign policy uh, and zero COVID to PAC policy. All right, PAC policy is definitely one of the highlights. President Xi, uh, for instance, called the tax sector a prime driving force of development going forward. Uh, Self-reliance on tax is a key goal of the party. Okay, he, he he put a lot of emphasis on uh, developing industrial technology like uh, aerospace, quantum computing, and satellite navigation. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, obviously, this is a response to the uh, U.S. recent new yes. restrictions on tech exports. So, going forward, for sure, okay. uh, China will do a lot. China will spend a lot. Uh, more on innovation to, you know, one of the goals is to lower uh, China's reliance on Western technology. Nathan, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. Violet, could you please mute all the participants in this webinar except for the speakers? Thanks. Thank you, Tamo and Violet. Uh, yeah, so for sure, we just talked about China will definitely uh, do more and spend a lot more on innovation. The goal is to lower China's reliance on uh, Western technology. And as far as a near-term economic outlook is concerned, uh, perhaps one of the most important message from the party Congress is that there is no change in zero COVID policy. Uh, the president defended zero uh, COVID policy uh, saying, you know, that the government is determined to put the people and their lives above all else, meaning there will be no quick exit in the near term. And in fact, uh, over the past two, like two to three weeks, there are renewed outbreaks and lockdowns in some provinces or, you know, some cities, like uh, some cities in Wuhan and uh, some cities in, in uh, Xining and some cities in Guangzhou and Henan also. Henan, there is a seven-day lockdown of the area around uh, Foxconn's factory producing iPhone, right? So uh, I would say this is an, another sign that there is no quick uh, pivot away from zero COVID policy, all right? And the next one would be um, common prosperity. President Xi promised to improve the personal income tax system, and he also called for a well regulated system of wealth accumulation. So, which means going forward in the next six to 12 months, I would say the likelihood would be quite high for the government to impose uh, more taxes 
for instance, property taxes and some uh, maybe inheritance taxes on the wealthy. All right. So I think these are some of the key takeaways that uh, might have uh, near term implications. And um, of course, I would dig deeper. Uh, next slide, please. So we just talk about no change in zero COVID policy, right? So consumption is bearing the brunt, has been bearing the brunt, and will continue to do so. And not only those contact intensive sectors uh, like transportation, catering, and hotels uh, facing uh, difficulties due to COVID curves, but you can see on this chart here, uh, the growth of retail sales across all categories are sl growing slower than previous years. Right, and you know, not just the zero COVID policy, but also the weak labor market is another major reason of the development. Uh, let's go to next slide. I have uh, put up some slide about income growth here on the left, uh, and in fact, we have heard a lot about pay cuts. Uh, we have heard a lot about hiring freeze, and income growth, in fact, is slowing. Uh, which is right now slower than the pre-pandemic level. Uh, you see the red bar there, 3.2% uh, in the first nine months, compared to about like 67 uh, before the pandemic, okay? And uh, people are sort of expecting lower future income, right? They're now more pessimistic than they were during the global financial crisis, as you can see on the right chart, which is the, uh, you know, future income confidence conducted by the PBOC. So right now it is 76.5, right? So obviously it's more or less the same level during the, uh, you know, in uh, uh, 2020 uh, when the outbreak just started, right? But obviously lower than the global financial crisis in 2008, okay? So against this backdrop, instead of spending their money, they chose to save, okay? Next slide, please. And so that's why you can see on the left, there is a notable rise in precautionary savings, okay? New increase in household deposits jump significantly during the first nine months, okay? A rise, a huge rise in precautionary savings. And that has also led to a slide in the velocity of money on the right, right? So velocity of money means that it measures the number of times that the um, uh, average unit of currency is used in, is used to purchase goods and services within a given time period, right? So the higher the better, but right now it's sliding. It's, uh, it's falling quite significantly. So all of this is not a good sign, especially lower future income expectation, uh, because usually most of those big ticket purchases require borrowings and repayments of loans in the future. So that explains why, uh, you know, those big ticket purchases like vehicle sales, for instance, right now remain well below pre-pandemic levels before 2019, all right? It also, uh, it also of course, impacts home sales. It drags uh, the recovery of the whole property market, okay? But of course, when it comes to the property market, uh, it, it's more complicated. On top of slowing income growth, on top of weak sentiment, uh, there's another factor dragging the recovery, which is the elevated household leverage. I have a chart on the next slide. So as you can see here, the red line, uh, which is the household debt to income ratio, which has been rising over the past decade from 40%, something about 40% to 140 uh, in 2021, right? 140 percent is just around the level in the U.S. right before the global financial crisis. All right, so it is kind of high. Uh, so that explains why households in China right now are sort of, um, you know, reluctant. They don't really want to uh, add a leverage. Okay, so that also explains why. Uh, if you have paid attention to the monthly loan figures, that explains why household long-term loans remain so sluggish. Right now, it's about like a 50% drop uh, uh, year on year, okay? And also that explains why uh, most of those measures to uh, stimulate home buyer demand are 
sort of having very limited impact because the leverage ratio is already very high. Okay, so that's why I have put up some uh, charts about the property market on next slide, please. Yeah, so property sales measured by floor space sold contracted by 23% last month. So which means the sentiment, it has been falling for quite a while, like more than a year. And last month, it is still contracting by more than 20%. So sentiment is still quite weak despite all of, the, all of those measures, okay? And prices have uh, basically been falling everywhere from tier one to tier three cities. And the supply side of the housing market doesn't look good either. The right chart shows uh, land purchases, new home sales, and uh, real estate investment, all of them are falling from 12% to 65% year on year, okay? Not only due to uh, weak home sales, but also uh, some of the developers are having difficulties raising funds, right? Um, next slide, please. I have a chart shows our in-house uh, property uh, index, okay? Uh, in terms of fundraising or bond prices, the picture uh, also look a bit ugly according to this, uh, you know, in-house index. Uh, investors kind of, you know, they continue to avoid the property sector, right? And um, in, if I remember correctly, the junk bond prices offshore had dropped more than 10% in August, I'm uh, sorry, yeah, in, in October, okay? Dragging down the Asian, high yield dollar bond by more than 8%. It's so, it's, it's so weak compared to the US and Europe, right? And one of the biggest drivers of the slide is that right before the party Congress, there was a, you know, an expectation, there's a hope that uh, some measures would be announced during the party Congress to stabilize the market, you know, to boost the property sector, some, you know, this sort of expectation. But then obviously the market was, was left disappointed which set off the heavy selling, okay? So, uh, but frankly speaking, we are not so surprised about the development as uh, we have been saying that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the property market, uh, we don't think the government will, will, allow, will announce some, uh, you know, drastic measures to generate a V-shaped rebound. No, this is not gonna happen, okay? Uh, because the government is so serious about houses are for living in, not for speculation. They still has this line in the script, okay, from the party Congress, okay? So to put it rather simple, uh, the recovery for the property sector is a, like, it's like an L-shaped recovery. It's not a V-shape, all right? Or it's not a U, it's like an L-shaped recovery. So, you know, because both cyclical and structural headwinds are holding back, uh, you know, any meaningful recovery in home sales. So that's why. And of course, we, are, we, we continue to see news about missed payments. Some big developers just fail to honor their uh, coupon payments, right? So that's why that's, that explains the heavy selling. You see the gray area uh, on the right. Uh, you can see clearly about like what happened after the party Congress in October. Right. Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, export. Export, which had been doing great in the first quarter, uh, but again is now slowing. Okay. And I will. I, will I, I expect it will slow further in the next few months because of the, uh, you know, the slowdown in the global economy. You know, in the U.S., our chief economist Tom Morris, you know, he expects virtually no growth in 2023, right? And uh, Europe is also having some sort of, you know, quite a challenging uh, situation here about the energy issues, right? So all of this will drag, all of this will have, you know, quite serious uh, negative impact on China's exports going forward, right? And the number, number two is the inflation. Inflation in the US and Europe are, uh, squeezing household disposable income over there, right? The real wages have been falling over the past year. People are tightening their bells. And, you know, th they are also changing their spending pattern as well, as you can see on the left chart here, because most of them right now are living with COVID, right? So what they want is to have more services instead of 
physical physical goods instead of merchandise from China. So that's why uh, you see clothing, you see furniture, uh, you know, computer, laptop. Uh, most of them are growing significantly slower than last year, right? And uh, the fourth reason of slowing growth ahead uh, is the infant is the destocking. Uh, phenomenon happening in the U.S. in some other, uh, you know, developed economies. Uh, most of the retailers over there, they still got a lot of inventories, uh, like Walmart and, you know, Target, Costco, Gap, all of them have accumulated a lot of inventories uh, over the past few quarters. Like, what they're now having is like 30 to 40 percent higher than they actually want. They're talking about destocking right now. So this is another reason why we are seeing so subdued Christmas orders when we talked about uh, when we talk to our uh, exports clients. Okay, and next slide, please. By region, uh, we just talked about exports growth is kind of slowing, right? But by region, uh, obviously those in the coastal areas slowed sharply on a yearly basis, on you know, in in terms of year on year, right? Because of the um, on and off lockdowns, most of those seaports, for instance, in in Guangdong, in uh, in in Shanghai, most of them were affected. Yes, there's like a, a, a closed loop operation, but still, there are interruptions, right? Like in logistics, in warehouses, or even uh, uh, labors. Okay, so that's why that explains the performance. Uh, you know the, the differentials between coastal and inland regions. Okay, next slide, please. So that's why against this backdrop, uh, you know, we just talked about exports is going to slow further, and then consumption recovery is is kind of low, slow as well because of the weak labor market. So against this backdrop, infrastructure will continue to be the main engine of growth, right? Not just this year, but also next year and the year after next. Okay, considering the size of the projects announced, uh, you know, altogether, all local government announced projects worth more than 14 trillion renminbi, which is like 12 or 13 percent of GDP. Okay, and uh, as you can see here, uh, especially those in the central and western region like um, uh, like Hubei, like uh, Ningxia and Anhui, uh, they are having high investment growth than the national average. Okay, next slide, please. And state-owned firms are doing more to stabilize the economy uh, because private demand remains weak. So that's why on the left, you see that uh, FAI by SOEs are you know, having a higher growth rate, like more than 10% growth year to day. Uh, and in contrast, private enterprises is about like 2% growth. And year to day, uh, year to date, they registered a 3.8 percent growth in terms of profit for the state-owned enterprises, and that for the private companies are negative 8 percent. Okay, so you can see the differences. Next slide, please. Loan growth. Uh, if you have paid attention to the loan figures, uh, which is monthly figures, you, you, you realize there was a rebound in September, right? And that's why you see the left chart here, the red bar. Uh, there is the, 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 the corporate long-term loan. And I believe a lot of this, again, goes to state-owned enterprises and, again, infrastructure. Uh, the reasons behind that is... Uh, you know, the annual quota for special bond issuance used up in July. So that's why uh, PBOC asked state-owned banks and policy banks to boost lending in the past two months. So that explains, okay? And uh, most of the money actually came from the PBOC. You may be asking, like, where the money come from, right? Most of the money came from the PBOC. They injected money to policy banks through uh, pledged supplementary lending on the right. You can see this is the first uh, launch in two years. All right, so that mostly explains the jump 
in corporate loans. So if hey, we Nathan, take- Nathan, I'm gonna yeah. ask you two quick supplementary questions. So one is, are you basically saying that this is money printing by PBOC that is creating the funds for the loans that is being extended to SOEs? And secondly, when you see infrastructure, is the composition of infrastructure changing? So are we moving away from say, large civil engineering projects like building malls and, or rather roads and highways to like more like green infrastructure? I mean, do you have any sense of that? Printing money, uh, sort of, but it's not exactly like the one happened in the Western world, like QE, because they are not buying, they are not buying, uh, 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 you know, government bonds, right? So uh, it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, and secondly, you ask about where the money go, right? Uh, you know, some of the money go to the new infrastructure. I would say most of the money goes to the new infrastructure. Like, uh, you know, they, they are, they are. They are sort of building more uh, AI facilities and those 5G and you know data centers. This sort of new infrastructure. This they are still building road and ports and highway, right? But relatively speaking, uh, more and more money went to the new infrastructure. Yeah. All right. So uh, the PBOC relaunch the pledge supplementary lending. So that's why we see a boost in corporate lending last month. And if we uh, take this part out, if we worry about private demand, right? So if we are worried about private demand, which is still not very strong actually, okay? So th the big picture is that, next slide please. The big picture is that since April, the right chart shows since April, the growth of new loans, the growth of uh, uh, aggregate financing have been slower than money supply. You see, the um, M M2 is the red line and the black one is the loans and the gray one is the aggregate financing, right? M2 is obviously growing faster than, you know, the other two. So, which means uh, loan demand is still quite weak you know, from this perspective. And the implication here is that it is not rate cut or it is not about liquidity injection. Liquidity has been quite ample, as you can see on the left chart here in the bank repo rate uh, has been most of the time stayed below the PBOC rate. So which means uh, liquidity have been so ample, right? And in terms of funding costs, it's not that high neither, right? So it's about subdued demand caused by the COVID, uh, the property market slowdown and slowing export demand. That, that has been dragging loan demand, right? So if, if, you, ask, if you ask me where, whether there will be another LPR cut, well, I would say not very likely from this perspective. It's about weak loan demand. It's not about funding cost. Right. Okay. So because of the weak fundamentals and sentiment, next slide, please. We have seen capital outflow via the um, financial account channel here. So you can see uh, the chart, the orange part, uh, which has been negative for the last two quarters. But of course, this is a quarterly data and up to the second quarter only. Let's take a look of some high frequency data. Next slide, please. Uh, we see that foreign investors, you know, on the on the on the left chart here, have been offloading uh, onshore assets like equities and and onshore bonds, right? Over the uh, over the past few quarters, right? And reason of offloading onshore bonds is obvious: the negative yield spread led by the divergent monetary policy between the Fed and the PBOC, as you can see on the right here. Uh, the negative spread right now, we are talking about 130 basis point, negative 130 basis point compared to 150 positive last year. So that is a huge difference. So that explains uh, the capital outflow and the weak uh, Chinese yen, of course, right? Next slide, please. Uh, but, you know, the weak uh, Chinese yen or the renminbi, not just Due to the fact that uh, you know the monetary policy uh, have been diverging between uh, the Fed and, Nathan, and the PBOC. Nathan, can I uh, pause you for a second? Uh, so Raj Hanta has a question. I think from the previous slide that the infer liquidity from the left hand side chart that you were showing earlier. Yeah. Is, is it this one? Raj, I, um, you're referring to this slide, right? Yeah. 
So just from the interest rate corridor, I mean, how are you seeing liquidity from that? Oh, what is your question again, Raj? Look at the section on the ch chat. It's written there. How can do you, explain again how can you, you explain again how you infer liquidity from the left-hand side chart? Like if, if uh, you know, if there's a liquidity squeeze, right, you sh we should be seeing the orange line to go up, to shoot up quite significantly. But over the past, you know, six months, we have been seeing the orange line have been hovering below the great line. The great line is set by the PBOC seven day report. This is sort of the guideline, this, this is sort of the benchmark uh, uh, for interbank uh, rate. So that's why we are seeing right now the real funding cost for banks right now have been, uh, you know, hovering below that level, which means liquidity remains ample. And the the red line is the ceiling of the corridor, and the black line is the is the floor. So, uh, the the goal of setting uh, this corridor is to have most of the time the interest rate to, uh, you know, to to hover within this range. This looks very similar to the way India, the Reserve Bank of India does liquidity adjustment facility, it seems to me. And I think I remember a few years ago, PBOC sort of consulting with the RBI in terms of how they were using the corridor to manage liquidity. Uh, so I think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I should have flagged, flagged this a little earlier, but uh, thanks for this. Yeah, exactly the same. I think pretty much the same. So whenever we see the orange line kind of shoot up above the uh, seven day report set by the PBOC, you should expect the PBOC to inject liquidity through open market operation, like reverse repo and you know some other channels, including the one that we just talked about, the PSL, the uh, the pledge supplementary uh, liquidity tool. Yeah. Go ahead, Nathan. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we just yeah. We just talked about the uh, the Chinese yen, right, which has been weakening uh, due to the divergent monetary policy between the U.S. and China. Not just this, but 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 also due to the fact that uh, you know the, the export growth has been weakening, right? Especially when all of China's major trading partners and competitors are weakening their currencies, like we see on the on the right chart, right? So for the renminbi, for the Chinese yen, it's been doing a catch up. Right, and and I think this trend will last till at least the Fed slow down interest rate height, or you know we we see more signal from the Fed that they will be you know giving the market some hints where we'll be ending their you know rate hike cycle. Right now, Tamo is expecting Q1 next year, so we should be seeing uh, you know the RMB to sort of stabilize in the next two months. Next slide, please. So. This is the last slide of my of my of my of my session. We talk about. Uh, we I also want to bring up this uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative. The reason I want to bring up this is uh, is that the you know the Party Congress, the report from the Party Congress, did not mention much about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it did not appear in the foreign policy section, as it did previously. Okay, but not this year. So it is quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. May, maybe it's a sign that Beijing, uh, you know, may have lowered, you know, their expectation for the program a little bit because of the, you know, the the, the big environment, the, the slowing global economy, uh, the rising interest rate and high inflation. Some countries been struggling to repay their debts, like Sri Lanka and and Pakistan. You know, and in fact, the BRI index on the right uh, is slowing down. So the BRI index here combines GDP figures of the BRI countries with their investment climate scores, right? So, 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 which means uh, you. So that's why you can see the black line there, and uh, you know the the the, the great line. Most of them are are slowing down, right? So the situation been deteriorating over the past two years because of the global backdrop. So that explains Beijing's low expectation for the program. It is understandable, right? And the left chart is, you know, the thing that I just just mentioned is consistent with the slowdown in the outward contracted projects on the left, especially the newly signed contract, the, uh, the red bar. Right. So going forward, I would say China will become more cautious about overseas investment and stay on banks will be more 
uh, rigorously evaluate new projects for financing, for instance, right? But it doesn't mean the BRI will stop here. Of course, no, this is not going to be the case because the program is very important in uh, you know, promoting China's role on the world stage. And you know, President Xi has made it very clear that one of the prime goals going forward is to secure China's status as a global power, global player. Right. So this is one of the means to achieve that goal. Okay. Nathan, to that so, point, uh, yeah. so this morning, I don't know if you saw this announcement that China and Pakistan have agreed on a $10 billion new uh, railroad project. Uh, I'm sure the funding 100% will come from the China side and will probably be part of BRI. I just want to ask you one question before we get uh, Sam to come into this thing. Um, BRI largely is G2G. But we are seeing Chinese companies, whether it is TikTok with data servers in Singapore or Huawei trying to set up uh, equipment plants outside to avoid some of the US sanction. We also have read about stories that there are more than 1,000 Chinese companies which have investments in Mexico to take advantage of the tariff free movement of goods from Mexico into the US. And now under the CHIPS Act, we again have more and more US produced components within this. Europe might do a euro first. So shouldn't we expect? Chinese companies, not necessarily just like G2G stuff, but the private sector also start looking more and more toward outward investment? Yes, of course. That is, that is definitely the trend, the ongoing trend, uh, especially against the backdrop of China's China plus one, right? And not only this, but also we should expect there will be uh, more, uh, you know, all of those transactions uh, we should we should expect to see more of them to be denominated in the Chinese yen instead of uh, US dollar going forward, right? That would be so, also very interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, some companies have been doing that. They borrow uh, the Chinese yen from uh, stay-owned banks onshore, and they use the loans to pay for capital goods in their country in yen, in Chinese yen, and they repay the loans using the revenue earned in Chinese yen. So it is like a... Uh, 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 a cycle, but right? Global so, circulation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we should expect more of this to happen going forward, and it is one of the ways for Beijing to internationalize the RMB going forward. A very important channel. Excellent, Nathan. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Before you start, uh, to all the seminar participants, please just like Raj did it very helpfully, uh, write your comments or questions in the chat section at the bottom right corner of our WebEx screen, and we'll take them as uh, Sam proceeds with his presentation. Sam, please go ahead. Sam, you're mute. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Okay, so thank you, Tamo, uh, and thank you, Nathan, for the presentation. So in the next section, I will um, talk about the Hong Kong latest economic situation, as well as some uh, policy focus from the policy address uh, of the new administration. So, um, so here we go. Uh, as we all know, the Hong Kong GDP, uh, the third quarter, was just released earlier this week, and it was very, very disappointing to, uh, I think, most of the people. Um, it is the deepest contraction since the uh, COVID time. Um, so, and if the border remains partially reopened, which means it's zero plus three days of quarantine, the first three days you land in Hong Kong, you have to, you can go to work, uh, but you couldn't go into restaurant or bars uh, for, for food. So um, if that remains, then we will see another year-on-year uh, -year contraction of GDP in the fourth quarter, uh, which according to our forecast, it will be at 1.1% uh, and conclude the year at 2.5% drop for the real GDP. So just like the, um, what Nathan had mentioned, the central government in the party, 20th Party Congress, uh, the direction is to tighten the zero COVID policy instead of relaxing it. So it is not likely for Hong Kong to relax this uh, zero COVID policy in the near term. So uh, for next year, uh, we forecast a 3.8% growth but it is largely due to the low base defect this year, which is negative 2.5%. And in fact, if we look at the table on the right-hand side here, this is a chart for uh, of different forecasts from different financial institutions or IMF and um, also economics. So we actually, we can see some of the other banks such as um, Goldman Sachs or, uh, or uh, BOA, they are also talking about a negative 1.5 or 3.2% growth this year already. So, 
um, I think the, uh, the the market consensus for Hong Kong economy is is pretty pessimistic, actually. So um, so for this slide, uh, this is there are two slides on the Hong Kong hotel room rate and occupancy rate. Um, and uh, the short-term quarantine requirement, which is uh, now zero for three days, actually poses positive impact on outbound tourism instead of inbound tourism. So uh, from the charts here, we saw that across different uh, hotel room classes, the occupancy rate has been declining. And um, that means tourists or business travel are not returning because you have the three days quarantine, you couldn't go to restaurant. Um, but for Hong Kong citizens, Hong Kong residents, they are all going out for uh, for, for, for traveling. So this will hurt the recovery of the retail sales and private consumption. And actually, if we look at the uh, private consumption expenditure components of GDP, it stayed flat for two consecutive quarters. And in fact, with this, uh, with, with the uh, cash voucher issuance, we should see some meaningful rebound, but we didn't see that. So that means the um, Hong Kong citizen or Hong Kong residents are actually uh, you know, going out for 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 you know for traveling and spending in that one country instead of Hong Kong. So the retail sales performance uh, looks quite bad in the past quarter. So um, in for September it only grew by zero point two percent. And if we look at the breakdowns, uh, big ticket items uh, looks fairly well, like motor vehicles, uh, it, uh, you know, um, mobile phone and jewelries. Uh, we saw some uh, meaningful rebound due to the cash voucher, but for the major items such as clothing, footwear, uh, supermarkets, uh, and also food or drinks or tobacco, all these items, we saw a, you know, quite a significant drop here. So that means the overall consumption sentiment is not really good. And if you look at the chart on the right hand side here, we are forecasting our, in our best case scenario, we are forecasting around is a flat growth for retail sales this year. And if uh, for next year, we are expecting a, around 10% growth, but that only means take us back to around 10% below the 2019 level where we had six months affected by the social unrest. So uh, retail sales, although we are having a 10% forecast growth next year for retail sales, that doesn't mean we are very optimistic on, on this sector. And uh, why the consumption sentiment in Hong is not good is also because of the uh, shrinking labor force. It has, it is now a structural issue. So if we look at a chart on the left hand side here, unemployment rate has been declining. Uh, but that doesn't mean the labor market is recovering very well because the labor force also declined. Usually when the economic situation improves, we should see the labor force increase because better economic condition uh, provide incentive for economically inactive people to rejoin the labor force, but labor force actually declining now. And if we look at a chart on the right hand side here, we have already lost around 300,000 population since 2021. Uh, so that means our consumption expenditure or consumption power has been declining. Sam, and, one, one quick question. Where are these people going? Uh, so mostly uh, they, are, they are going to uh, the United Kingdom because uh, the, the, the United Kingdom uh, relaxed the uh, BNO, the British National Overseas Passport um, application, and they can now stay in uh, United Kingdom. And it's also reflected by the airline tickets fare. It's, uh, I think it's jumped by almost double since the COVID time. And second uh, destination, probably they're going to Singapore uh, because a lot of these people um, finance professional. So as we can see in the chart on this slide here. So uh, on the chart of the, the chart on the right hand side, we can see that the labor force the uh, drop is more severe in financing, insurance and professionals comparing to the headline figure. So these people, they're most likely they're going to Singapore because uh, they can uh, work in the same sector, uh, more, more, they're more likely to work in the same sector um, in Singapore than comparing to working in UK or other places like Sydney or, or Canada. So, and if we look at a chart on the left hand side here, um, this is a labor force growth chart for, uh, by different age group. So the prime working age uh, workforce, which is 25 to 40, uh, 44, 
uh, dropped by 3.9% uh, year on year. And this constituted around 80% of the drop uh, of total labor force. So that means the high income group and the higher and those people who has a high propensity to spend, they are leaving Hong Kong. And, um, it, and there is a sharp rise in uh, labor force for the elderly, but that couldn't uh, you know, uh, fill up the gap because the elderly or the retired people, uh, they probably are not earning as much as the prime working age. And the reason why they rejoin the labor force is mainly due to the reason that the uh, economic situation in Hong Kong is, is pretty bad. So that's why they have to rejoin the labor force. So, um, so overall, from a labor market perspective, the Hong Kong economy is not doing good, and this will be through into the private consumption, where the private consumption actually con constituted around 60% of our GDP. So this is quite alarming indeed. So uh, this slide, uh, we will move on to the external sector. Um, I would say external sector is a relatively brighter spot. Uh, because the Hong Kong uh, government is relaxing the zero profit policy to zero plus three days, uh, if not zero plus zero in the next quarter. Um, so the capacity of um, of flights uh, or or the or shipment has been increased. And if you look at the chart on the left hand side here, this is a chart for the number of flights of Cafe Pacific. It's actually jumped quite sharply uh, in the past few months when the uh, Hong Kong started to relax the zero profit policy. So, but then, uh, so if we look at the chart on the right hand side here, um, the exports performance is not doing well. We saw quite, uh, quite a few consecutive months of year on year decline, but it has been improving, especially those to China. Uh, I think the major reason here is the um, increasing capacity of Hong Kong international travel and international or, in, or import export trade. But um, this could be offset by the external head we mentioned by Nathan, uh, which is the um, you know this um, slower China economic growth during zero COVID policy, and also the inflation in the U.S. and the EU, which poses negative impact on the demand of Chinese goods re-export through Hong Kong. So the export performance in the near term probably it will rec recover, but it at a fairly uh, modest pace. And um, the other major problem of Hong Kong is the uh, investment confidence. So if we look at the GDP component um, this week, the investment component actually dropped by 40.3% year on year, uh, which means the investment confidence is very, very, very weak. Um, this investment component constituted by two uh, major parts. One is the machinery, the other one is the real estate. Uh, and both of them are, should be quite, looks quite bad. The government hasn't re uh, released the actual figure for these two components, but um, we assume that both numbers are doing very bad because, of, because the economic situation is, is gloomy and also the asset market is not doing well. And if we look at the chart on the right-hand side here, this is a loan growth of uh, loans used in Hong Kong by the economic sector. So the, the, the loan growth for transportation is very bad because of the zero COVID policy and also that to investment company and stockbrokers uh, very weak for obvious reason, which is the weak financial market performance. And there is basically no major IPO in Hong Kong. So the loans to the sector are very, very bad. And even for residential property development, it is quite weak as well. So um, moving forward, we should see the investment component in GDP continue to under some pressure. Uh, as far as interest rate is concerned, uh, the Federal Reserve just raised uh, another uh, 75 bips uh, overnight, and um, it is very likely for the Hong Kong interest rate uh, high balls to continue to catch up with the US dollar rate. And um, so right now, the high ball already reached 3.21% uh, as of today. Um, and uh, Hong Kong dollar will, of course, under pressure and HKMA will continue to defend the Hong Kong dollar, thereby pushing the aggregate balance, which is the interbank liquidity of Hong Kong. Uh, it, it will push it down. So uh, high ball will continue to increase, funding call is increased, and thereby you know, uh, impacting the loan demand in the future. So capital outflow persists. 
Um, so the uh, foreign reserve, as we see in the chart on the right-hand side here, has been dropping quite significantly uh, since the peak. Uh, but we are not very worrying about the DPAC because um, the, the ratio of um, foreign reserve to, um, to monetary base uh, remain uh, quite high at 170%. So uh, there are enough bullets for HKM to defend the Hong Kong dollar pack. But um, of course, the, the, the capital outflow is alarming. If we look at the chart on the left-hand side here, uh, the capital outflow, um, in fact, it, is, it reached historical high uh, in the past quarter, in the sec second quarter of this year. So um, if the zero COVID policy is not, um, you know, uh, uh, it is not further relaxed, then we should see the economy continue to slow down and perhaps more capital outflow moving forward. So, and then uh, the property market. Um, so earlier this morning, uh, uh, HSBC and some other banks started to raise the uh, prime rates again. So uh, the effective mortgage rate has reached 3.125% already. And um, that against the, uh, you know, the investment return of residential classes of different residential classes at two to 2.6%. That means you are, there is a negative yield. Uh, so for the chart on the left-hand side here, we can see that the um, overall property price already dropped by 8.9% this year. And the, the decline was very, very severe in the past month. On the month-on-month -month basis, it's dropped by 1.4%. Sam, so, yep. uh, if I may ask you a question, and this is a question for both you and Nathan. We know that mainland uh, property companies also use Hong Kong for fundraising, capital raising purposes. And of course, you know they will also find these sharp increase in interest rates a, a big source of you know cost, increase in cost uh, for raising capital. So question for Nathan, I mean, what is the sentiment among China-based companies, mainland China-based companies who do fund themselves in Hong Kong. And uh, same to Sam. I mean, it, it, how, I mean, of course, you know, you will comment on what it means for Hong Kong-based property developers. Uh, but I also want to ask you, it's not just about the Hong Kong property market. Hong Kong property developers are, for example, very big players in Singapore. So what happens to their cost of funding? So I, could you both please weigh in on this issue? All right. Uh, for sure, this is not this. This is this is a negative to onshore companies because, uh, uh, especially for property developers, right? Because offshore market has been one of the major, uh, you know, channel for them to raise funds. But then, right now, the yields are surging and demand is dropping, uh, so the situation is definitely doesn't look good to them. And other than property developers, this is also not a very good news to those in other sectors. And uh, but but the backdrop is that demand is slowing, right? The demand is slowing down quite significantly, and that's why uh, fundraising activities right now is not as robust. So, so right? Nathan, just a supplemental question on that. I'm also cognizant of the refinancing risk, right? So there are a lot of hard currency borrowers in mainland China uh, who are facing A, weakening of the RMB and B, surging cost of refinancing if they are going to tap hard currency market. So from a strategy perspective, have you heard anything from PBOC or any other Chinese government officials or agencies that they will help those with currency mismatch that they can swap or, or refinance domestically, use PBOC's reserves or you know dollar liquidity to pay off their external debt or, or, or their Hong Kong dollar debt, anything like that? Uh, this few days, I have read that uh, the policymakers have been you know talking to some of the developers, right? But no concrete uh, solutions, no concrete outcome yet. Uh, but just they're sort of discussing how to facilitate a smoother uh, fundraising channel, but they have not specifically talked about offshore channel. So uh, if the situation uh, to become more challenging, I believe they will they will sort of you know inject liquidity through some channels to those uh, distressed developers. I, I hard currency so. liquidity so that they yeah. can refinance and then maybe 
get it, refinanced domestically or something like that? Yeah, that depends on the size and de that depends on the impacts, especially those that have great impact on local economies, then, you know, uh, the chance for them is hard to get uh, 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 help from the policymakers. Yeah. Uh, Sam? Okay. So uh, I think right now for Hong Kong, uh, developers are mostly quite cash rich. So in view of this rising interest rate environments, the main problem for them is not the rising funding cost. It's the rising funding cost for the, the property investing of the developers or the potential home buyers. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, the, as I said, the, uh, the, uh, in, the interest rate for uh, effective mortgage rates is already higher than the rental yield return. So the investment demand will be weak and also the home buying activity has been dropping. So uh, as far as the transaction is concerned, it, is all, it all actually dropped by, like I think for primary market, it dropped around 40% last month reportedly. So uh, this is the major reason of um, the residential property development loans as shown in the chart here is quite weak at 1.5% only. So the uh, developers, is they don't they are not stressing out for their funding costs but in view of the demand from their customer they are not borrowing so they are not borrowing money to do further development so that is a major problem for for these developers and for chinese property developers i think the uh, offshore lending funding cost is also increasing um and uh, uh, because the Hong Kong interest rate has to follow the U.S. interest rate anyway, and we see the high ball probably will uh, one month high ball, let's say it will probably reach um, uh, almost four uh, percent in the in the next couple of quarters. So um, this is this will also affect the Chinese property developers well if they are borrowing money from Hong Kong, because you know in the past few years when the funding cost is extremely low in Hong Kong comparing to China. Uh, Chinese property developers can come to Hong Kong to raise fund through bond issuance or just borrow loans from the banks. But uh, in this such in such you know um, uh, rate high cycle, this situation like this funding channel will be difficult for them as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, going back to this slide, uh, uh, so I'm although I said the uh, property market is quite weak right now but we don't see a uh, large scale consolidation moving forward so as we see in the chart of the right hand right hand side chart here um the the center line uh, leading index of course is dropping but for uh the negative equity uh, ratio is actually still quite low at 0 0.2 percent only so we are not too worrying about the default risk of hong kong and after all the loan to value ratio is still quite low comparing to the peak and um, so we think that the uh, property price will, will, prop will continue to slow down, but this is not a collapsing scenario. And in fact, the Hong Kong government could uh, relax some sort of property market um, regulation or, or policy moving forward. Um, in the past two months, HKMA already relaxed the stress testing uh, requirement. And John Lee, the new chief executive, also mentioned that uh, they will redefund the tax for uh, foreign investors if they stay in Hong Kong for seven years. So I think the Hong Kong government will continue to relax some sort of uh, property market policy so to stabilize the, the asset price. Uh, as far as the... Uh, uh, Sam, uh, just for everybody's information, um, the total stock of US dollar debt by Chinese corporates is something about 150 billion, of which about half is by Chinese property developers. So, of course, you know, China is such a large economy and PBOC has, you know, trillions of reserves. These are not very large numbers. And also, if you think the total stock is about 150 at any given year, assuming average duration is four, five, four, five years, we're talking about 20 billion of refinancing due. So one hand i'm very worried on the other hand the numbers comp from PBOC's perspective you know they, they can handle these things just wanted to make it clear to everybody that we're not forecasting some sort of a subprime type crisis or an asian 997 type crisis yep absolutely come on um okay so so continue let me uh quickly go through this slide as we are running out of time so uh for hang Seng index of course we all know there is a very brutal sell off in the past two weeks um and um so the so and 
this this is because the um, negative factors are you know affecting the asset market will not go away soon. So that include what Nathan has mentioned, the zero COVID policy in China as well as in Hong Kong, and the uh, regulatory crackdown uh, after the party congress mentioned the redistribution of wealth. So there will be a lot of uh, negative impact, uh, things around the corner as well as the U.S. interest rate hike is not at, uh, going to the peak very soon. So um, and if we look at a chart on the right hand side here, the um, uh, RMB exchange rate has been declining sharply. Uh, it almost reached seven point three. So uh, this actually strongly correlated with the Hansang index. So uh, the Hansang index, we should see um, quite some volatility uh, moving forward. And um, the investors already turned quite defensive. So according to our sector analyst, they have already upgraded some of the sector that is that provides stable earnings, such as the telecom companies. And um, uh, we also upgraded sectors such as uh, hardware and uh, 5G related uh, uh, sectors, because this is the government focus, uh, or the government development focus moving forward. And just as Nathan has mentioned, the major infrastructure investment are, in, are all in these new infrastructure. So this is the prime uh, focus or the investment focus uh, theme for the next couple of quarter. And uh, we have downgraded some other sectors um, related to zero growth policy, such as the food and beverage, and uh, also the property sector as well, of course. And the interest rate high will also dampen the um, Hong Kong uh, uh, property sector as well. And uh, uh, last but not least, I would like to discuss a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the policy address of Hong Kong. And which is very, very GBA focused. Uh, so Greater Bay Area performance was quite disappointing, as mentioned by Nathan earlier. Uh, the exports or retail is retail sales is quite weak in Greater Bay Area because um, the zero COVID policy is hurting this area very, very severely comparing to you know inner uh, inland area. So um, and also the GBA area is quite um, the, the the property market is. is Got a big problem of, of highly leverage in this area. So the GDP as well as property market performance in GBA is not doing well. But that doesn't change the fact that GBA will be the future growth engine. And in fact, if we look at the, the fixed asset investment of GBA, uh, advanced manufacturing, IT investment, hardware, they we are seeing like 70% year on year growth in this area. So we should see some. Uh, we should continue to see GB as a major growth engine. And that's why the Hong Kong government um, in their latest policy address focus on GBA. So there will be three new railway uh, connecting with Shenzhen moving forward. And the government pledged to um, develop this area and move 40% of the government office from Central and Admiralty to the new territory law. Thank and you, uh, Nathan. Thanks very much. Uh, it goes back to Nathan's point earlier when I was asking him about infrastructure. That, I mean, I was hoping that he was going to say most of the money is going to green infrastructure, but he said no. There is still quite a bit of on transportation network, and your slide here shows that you know a lot of these you know very ambitious projects. And then, as we were discussing in the context of BRI, we are running out of time, uh, Nathan. So we will, uh, Sam. I'm just going to end this with one question to Nathan. Nathan, you have to say something about China, Taiwan, and U.S. You're mute. Intentionally? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, on, on Taiwan, uh, President Xi used uh, stronger words, obviously, during the party congress. Uh, he said that like complete reunification of the country must be realized, and it can be realized without doubt, right? So, and that they will take all measures necessary to achieve that. So obviously this is, you know, just sort of, you know, stronger words. And he also emphasized that uh, China's military had been strengthened a lot under his watch and promised that nation's rejuvenation was on an, uh, you know, irreversible course, right? So it seems like uh, to the market that he want to uh, put the world on notice that, uh, you know, they are prepared to confront uh, any country that stands in the way of national rejuvenation, right? So uh, that's my that's my feeling. So if you're worried about military confrontation, I would I would say the tail risk is sort of uh, getting higher. Uh, yeah, that's what I get. That's what I receive from the uh, party congress.
I appreciate it, Nathan. I think uh, it goes back to uh, some Western analysts uh, point, which is that we should sort of take the statements that's coming from the CCP in face value. We should believe them that they are not innuendos. They are not hints of something else. It, it is what it is, and we should just take them literally in terms of the promises and the plans. Uh, we have frankly run out of time. This can go on for two hours. I thank the 175 odd participants in this webinar. Thank you very much for your time and patience listening to us. We hope this was good value added for your work, and uh, we will uh, come back to you in the coming weeks uh, with our annual outlook. Look forward to that. But for now, uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Nathan, very much. And uh, signing off, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Bye bye.